I filmed this video in front of a closet, so you're going to hear a slight echo. Hello, welcome to a Q&A session. I asked my viewers to ask me anything that they want, and I've accumulated a lot of questions here, and in this video I'm going to answer them. So Sega Retrope Vu asked, if everything burned in your house and you can save one console, which one would it be? My heart says that I should save the S video modded Sega Genesis, but in actuality, I think I would be saving the PS5. There's just too much of a future for that one. It still has its value, at least for now, and I have a lot of games I'm going to be playing on it in the future, so. DJ Rainey asks, I know this question will probably be asked a lot, but what was the thing that got you into collecting? I kind of got hit with the collection culture by following a couple of YouTubers, like the Angry Video Game Nerd and Classic Game Room, and I also visited this site called Video Game Critic and it's still up today if you want to check it out. I was at some point bored and I started reading game reviews on that site and I started reading the Atari 2600 reviews and that's when I got bit by the bug I think. That was the the main thing that set this all off. From reading those reviews I got more interested in replaying some of the Atari 2600 games I grew up with and also playing ones that I never got to play back then. The Bedtime Boy asks, what was the first few systems you owned and at what point did you decide to start seriously collecting them? I mentioned I was watching Classic Game Room and I was going to the Video Game Critics site and that was around 2007-ish, I think. At some point I bought a big box of Atari 2600 games, a, a huge lot, off of eBay and when they arrived uh, it was so fun to go through through them and play them again and that kind of led to me buying other things and so on and so on and so on. It, it was just my expansion of interest. The first few systems I had was, you guessed it, the Atari 2600. I actually had a Pong console in the house but I didn't really play it much. It was the 2600 when that came into the house. That's when I really became interested in video games. I, I had that for many 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 years and eventually I got an Atari Junior when that came out and I think that would have been like 1986 or so. I'm getting the, the years mixed up. But I did get a uh, Nintendo at some point, an NES, and so I went from Atari to the NES which was the natural cycle that most people uh, followed back then. JJ Jameson, the real Spider-Man asked, what made you create a YouTube channel and collecting systems and discs? The YouTube channel came probably about a year or two after I started collecting and I started planning for a room like this one. And I thought, well, that could be my little thing I do on YouTube. I show the collection and me building the setup and talking about the setup. And it just kind of grew from there. I, I thought that I had a little bit to share uh, to people online and that's how it got going. Here's another question from the Bedtime Boy. Have you ever considered a retro gaming podcast? I do not think that would be a good fit for me because I have speech problems. Luckily for you, I do a lot of editing to get rid of the mixed up things that I say. Also, that's just another thing that would take up a lot of time and I don't have any time at all to take on anything additional. I don't think that's going to be in the works. But never say never. Chicago asks, would you ever game with fans or do calls with them? Once again, I don't think I would be good in that situation. Perhaps I might do a stream or two. Uh, in those scenarios, I think I can get away with it because most of it would be me playing the game and not speaking as much. At least that's how I would do it. Do calls with fans. Uh, I, once again, that's going to be very awkward both for me and for you. Uh, I might get better at it if I do it for enough, but it's going to take a lot of it for me to get good at it. I grew up with speech problems and uh, they persist today. Okay, Downs47 asks, Do you plan out what games you want to play each year, or do you want to play games based on certain criteria, if any? No, I don't really. I've tried that before, but I, f I find that I never follow my own plan. What I do try to do is try to complete each game that I start. I have a folder that holds my high scores too, so if it's that kind of game, I try to get the high score. I, I really don't want to be one of those people that will play like the first stage and then put it away for a few years. I want to fully experience each game. So I think that's the best way to play. If you find this video hot, 
Then click the oven mitt button so you don't burn your hands. What would you say led to you collecting the way you do? I have read a lot of magazines. In fact, I have a complete EGM collection. But even before I recollected them later in life, I was always reading them. So I was very aware of all the games I was missing and all the game systems that passed by and I never got a chance to play them. So I just decided, hey, let me go back and play all those things. That's kind of the central point to this room is to be able to play any old console from the past. Have you used EverDrive's ODEs? If so, what are some? I forget what ODE stands for, but I, I think that's where you replace the CD-ROM uh, player in your system with a SD card or something. I never went that route, and so I don't have any of those devices in this room, and at this point, I don't need to have them because I pretty much have access to the original hardware. But I do have the Retron 77 and a Retron 5 and a bunch of mini systems. So I do have access to play ROMs in that way. Lastly, what cat do you find hanging out in your game room the most? The cat that likes to be in here the most is T-Rex and he ruins a lot of my shots. Okay, Elliot D asks, did slash would you ever consider playing the older consoles via RGB SCART slash component through an upscaler on your modern flat screen? Or do you prefer playing them on your CRT? This question has is one of the top questions I've gotten throughout the years. And I have chosen not to do it that way simply because I have a CRT here with a bunch of consoles stacked around it. I have a ton of consoles stuffed into a small space. Now, if I were to try to connect all those to that flat screen TV, TV that's on the other side, it would be a wiring mess. They would have to be long wires for them to all converge into one upscaler. It's just a logistical mess. Another reason not to do it, it's just way more complicated than it needs to be. Just listen to this montage of actual YouTubers talking about it. One setting you should check when using composite video is the YC filter. Most systems should look cleaner with the four line comb filter, especially the NES. On screen display calls this vertical sync and it determines how frame timings are generated. Supported input resolutions are 240p, 480i, 480p, and their PAL equivalents with 720p width on those does have to be downsampled from Flightly Clean Up My PC Engine's jail bars, which are especially- There's also basic deinterlacing on board in the form of bob and weave, which basically just line quadruples each field separately, but you'll still get the same shimmering and flickering that interlaced video is famous for. Plus you get into other things like the light guns don't really work on the flat screen. I realized that you can get better picture quality by upscaling for most of the systems, but I absolutely enjoy playing on the CRT. I have no problem with it at all. A lot to think about. There's a lot of ways to do things. I'm not dissing the way you do it. This is just how I do it, and there's no need to change this. It already took a, a long time to wire this. I don't want to go through any more wiring. But like I said, never say never. Okay, Arcade Dude 44 asks, do you have any retro computers, Commodore, Atari, etc., from either the 8 or 16-bit era? I do not, but I do have an Atari XCGS. It's not quite a computer, but it's compatible with the Atari 8-bit computer systems. I've actually posted a review of the ET game that was played on that. That's that was actually an 8-bit computer game, but I played it on the XCGS. But no, I'm not really drawn to those computer systems. I, I have to draw the line somewhere on what I'm going to play and what I'm going to collect because there's only so much time in life and there's only so much room in this room. I don't want my collection to take over the house. What system needs the most repairs? The first thing that comes to mind is the NES. As you know, it blinks a lot. It has a weird mechanism that bends the pins over time. I've had other issues with mine, with the picture quality and so forth, but the one console that's driving me nuts repair-wise is the original Xbox. I've gone through so many of them the hard drives fail, the disk tray fails. I've looked up online how to replace those things with mixed results. After a while, I just gave up and it's sitting up there on my shelf and I don't play it because next time I play it, I have to repair it again. Uh, it, it does not work. There's a lot of people online that say, oh, mine works all the time and stuff. I just haven't had any luck with that one. But it was a very overpowered console, so 
it shouldn't be a surprise that the components are failing. Uh, but luckily a lot of those games are backward compatible with the Series X. And yes, I do know about the leaky capacitor. I've done that repair on mine. It didn't have any acid, but I took that out anyway. Joe the Chevy Man 69 asks, what is the most heavy system in your collection? Let's find out. So I was gonna do this thing where I weighed the different systems in the room, but I couldn't get the scale to work. YouTubing is hard. I suspect that the heavier ones are the original Xbox and the Atari 5200, but I looked online and apparently the PS3 is the heaviest. I lifted my PS3 up and it does indeed feel heavy, but I don't think it's the same model they are talking about. So I may never know which is the heaviest in my room, but I suspect it's the original Xbox. What system do you reckon you've played the least in your collection? The original Odyssey I have never played because I'm missing the wire that connects it to the TV. The Apple Pippin I don't have any games for, so technically I've never played it, but I have turned it on. Hossam asks, are you strict on the one per console rule? Any console slash handheld you target to have all variants. <coughs> I don't have this room to just collect the consoles. Its main purpose is to play them. And if there's two variations of the same console, I have no need to own both. That being said, I do have multiple variations of the DS simply because I was buying those as they came out and I always wanted that upgrade because I always felt like the screens on the DS were small. So every time they came out with one that was bigger and better, I always upgraded and I kept the old ones. But yeah, for the most part, I don't have multiple variations of the consoles. I'm just not that type of collector. I'm not here to look at the systems. I'm here to play them. Oh, he also asks, what is your day job? I work for a large financial company in the back offices. I don't work directly with customers, but I do things on behalf of customers. Any tiny creatures in your household? No, the smallest creature I have is Midnight the cat. She's kind of small, but not sure if that's what you mean, but I don't have any gerbils or anything like that. Elliot D asks, what is your criteria for game collecting? For example, do you collect any game you can find? Only games you anticipate on playing, games of specific genres, childhood favorites, etc. For the most part, I only purchase games that I plan on playing one day. So that could be one that I'm just curious about, one that I missed out on growing up, one that just interests me because I've read about it, and ones that I've already played in the past and I want to re-experience. Now, if I go into a thrift store, and I see a good deal on a game that's really bad, I'm probably gonna pick it up. There's a lot of clunkers in my possession, but that's not my main focus. Where do you find you are buying most of your retro games from, from now? eBay. I've, it's always been eBay. It's where I got 80% of this stuff behind me. I occasionally go to the stores, but I just find it easier to just grab what I need off eBay and let it come to me as opposed to me going out and sorting through a bunch of shelves. Nowadays, I have this problem where I go into a video game store and unless I have a list of what I already own, it's really hard to buy something that I don't already own. I've been known to accidentally buy something twice. Uh, Joe the Chevy Man 69 is back and he's asking, do any bugs crawl up in your systems? What inspired you to create Rodney's Crawlspace Gaming? I think those two questions might be connected. The only bugs I've ever seen inside a system were an Atari 2600 that I bought Years ago, uh, me and my friend split it. We bought it from the flea market. Uh, I think this was way before my collecting phase. Yeah, indeed it was. It didn't work and I opened it up and there were some dead roaches inside of it. So how did the character of Rodney come about? Well, I used to play this game called Rainbow Six Siege. Maybe you've heard of it. And I would have voice chats with a lot of people across the PlayStation Network because it was a very voice chat driven game. In order to know where the enemy is in that game, you have to rely on people telling you where they see them. And one time I just heard this kid on there talking about his home life and I kind of uh, got the character off of him. It was rattling off about things happening at home regarding his stepdad and stuff. He seemed kind of resilient to the things going on at home. And so that's kind of where I got the Rodney character from. 
It's not a replication of that kid. It just inspired the character. He uses resiliency to get past the bad things that are happening around him. Another inspiration for the character was I was downstairs uh, working in the crawl space. I thought maybe I'd just do a little joke where I make a gaming setup down there because it seemed like the worst place to have a gaming setup. I thought it would be a perfect contrast to the main video game room that I have upstairs. Really bizarre, but it was fun to, to put together. Right Leftwich asks, what is your most satisfying pickup and what was your biggest miss slash bought too late? I was in a game store and they had Bomberman 64 on the shelf. But when I picked it up to look at it, it said Bomberman 64 Second Attack, which is a more rare version of the two games. Uh, they had it labeled as the first game, so I basically got the second game for the price of the first game. Uh, I felt a little sneaky doing it that way, but that, that's what I would call a steal, I guess. You asked me what the most satisfying pickup was. I wouldn't say that was satisfying. Uh, it was just a good deal. There's another time where I got Musha for the Genesis that was part of this big Genesis lot. There was tons of games and I saw Musha was in there and I bought the whole lot. I guess that was before people were actually trying to get that game because I didn't have that many competitive bids. So I got the whole lot for a good deal and it had Musha in there and I played through it. Later on, it ended up selling Musha because I actually do sell some of my games after I finish them. Another satisfying pickup what I've already talked about and that was the Atari 2600 lot that I purchased when I first started collecting. Biggest misses. Well, I went to a garage store, this was before collecting, and someone was selling a Sega Master System with the 3D glasses and a bunch of games. I bought it, and then for some reason I decided to sell the 3D glasses. And I regret that I should have kept those. I didn't realize I would be going back to playing Master System later in my life. In fact, I think I sold the whole entire Master System. The, the one I currently have, I'm pretty sure that's not the same one. So I lose track of things over time. I've had so many purchases and transactions, but I do remember getting rid of those 3D glasses. Uh, now they're a little bit harder to find, so. Timothy Joyce asks, any plans for Elden Ring or any other Soulsborne games? I know Otogi by From Software is a favorite of yours. Yes, I do like the Otogi games. I do have some of the other Souls games as well, but I haven't uh, started on any of those yet. I don't think I'll be playing Elden Ring. It just looks like a very long game and I would rather play ones that are not open world. I did play through Elder Scrolls Oblivion recently and it took me probably like four months to get to the end, at least how I played. That chewed up a lot of my time and I didn't really want to get back into a game like that. I'm Johnny S. What is your favorite system to collect for? I would have to say the 2600 and the Dreamcast because they're relatively inexpensive. Most Dreamcast games are good. Even the ones you haven't heard of tend to be good. I also like NES games. Of course, those are a lot harder to collect for, but they do bring back a lot of memories. I enjoy popping in an NES game that I've never played before. Spanish Ginger asks, how many games do you aim to play slash finish each month? In a good period, about four a month. These are the games I've beat recently. Zenith System 3 asks, if future consoles are digital only, would you get one? Or at this point, would you just play the consoles you now have? After all, with all the game price inflation happening, you have a lot of games a lot of people can't even find. That is true. Um, I do think if there was a PlayStation 6 that was digital only and that was the only way to get it, I would probably end up buying that. I do have a digital only console already and that's the Ouya. And of course, I have a lot of the mini systems that have the games built in. So there's already a lot of systems in this room that do not take cartridges. Also, the future Xboxes are going to be intriguing because they're going to basically come with a game streaming service. They basically already have that. It may not make sense to boycott digital only consoles. Electro-27 asks, do you have any tips for collecting GameCube or Dreamcast games? The prices have really gone up recently. My advice is to not collect. Burn those games, emulate those games. Do whatever it takes because the prices, like you said, are too high and they're just gonna keep getting higher. Even when you do purchase them, you're going to not want to touch them because you might break them 
because they're so expensive. Like, why even play this? It's $100 now. Especially for those Nintendo games. Nintendo games, in my opinion, are overpriced compared to the competitors. There's like a premium to have the Nintendo name on them. I do not think GameCube games are worth what people are paying for them now. Peon Carl asks, how do you handle wires and cords? I have Velcro tape that I use to wrap around the wiring on my setup. I also use black twister seals, which help me tie up certain cords and make them go a certain direction. Good question. Arturo Olivo asks, how much space do you need for a gaming room? I'm not sure how big this room is, but I've been able to cram a lot on two different walls. In actuality, if you take my advice and just emulate, all you need is a monitor and a computer, and you could have that in a closet if you have to. It just depends on what you wanna do with the space. It depends if you're buying boxed items, if you're buying the plushes and stuff. If I was advising a future person, I would just say pick the smallest room in the house that's not a closet and not a bathroom and make that your emulator room and find a really good comfortable office chair and sit at the monitor and play those games. Saga asks, you got the Astro City Mini or the upcoming Taito Egret 2 Mini? I'm not gonna get those. I do have one system that's kind of like that, the Neo Geo Mini down there. But other than that, uh, I'm not really into the tabletop games of that manner. I'd rather play them on my TV. They basically keep finding new ways to re-release the same games over and over again. And I'm not going to continually buy all those different products, but we'll see how it goes. Game Trader asks, what is your electricity bill per month? I actually looked at my last bill and it is $75. It's the winter time here that goes up during the summertime. If you're asking that question because you're assuming this setup increases my energy costs, it doesn't really because most of the time I'm just playing one system on one TV. This setup does not continually draw power from the grid when the things are off. I have switches up near the top that turn everything off so there's no vampire power being sucked from the grid or whatever. I'm only spending power on whatever I'm playing. So if someone just has one system, one TV, and they're set up, they're paying as much extra for electricity as I am. I'm not sure if that's the way, way you was going with that question, or maybe you was um, referring to how many times I've been asked that. Pizzamon79 has a lot of questions. Do you plan on going to any cons? I've been to one locally and it was just like wall-to-wall -wall people and I don't know, I would just rather buy stuff off eBay. I, I'm not ever going to do like a presentation or anything like that for people that's totally out of my league. Even if I had a million subscribers, I would probably not do one of those panels. He goes on to ask, have you heard John Hancock brags about the money he makes off donated games for his supposed museum? That's never going to happen. Um, I don't really follow that kind of stuff. I do watch John Hancock videos when I'm bored. When I hear something about this on the internet, I have to take it as a grain of salt because stories like that can get legs one of my viewers believes that this room is CGI, and no matter what I say to him, I think he's going to continue to believe that. But I could picture that becoming a big rumor and gaining legs uh, as a rumor on the internet, and I wouldn't be able to control it. Anyway, my, my point is that I'm just not into the big drama of YouTube. But if I do see John Hancock being arrested with his Altered Beast hat on, then uh, I know he's in some big trouble. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, thoughts on Black Friday shopping at 6 p.m. on Thanksgiving. I absolutely hate shopping. I hate Black Friday. Um, I hate the holiday time of shopping. Even though I have stood in line for game systems before, but uh, that's different. <laughs> Zupergato1 asks, and I think this is in, either in Spanish or Portuguese, but I think I can read it. Why do you not have Japanese or European consoles in your collection, like the PCFX, Playdia, Loopy, FM Towns, Marty, and so forth? I do have some Japanese consoles in my collection. I have the Japanese version of the Apple Pippin. I have a Watara Supervision. 
I have a Neo Geo CD. But as for those other ones, I don't have a deep connection to them. And I also have to draw the line because like I said earlier, I don't want my collection to take over the house. So I really don't have room for all those other countries systems to be added to my setup uh, with the exceptions that I just stated. Troy's Movies is asking me, how's the console numbering system work? Like why X console has X number? I have a numbering system consisting of numbers between one and 99. So basically each system has a number and that number corresponds to a number on the power switch as well. And in a lot of cases, it corresponds to a number on a switch box. All those things together let me know what I need to push to play a game. But I have gaps in there as well. So if I ever buy a new system and want to insert it into the setup, I will give it a number. I might boot one of the other systems out of the way to make room for it. This 11 spot will stay the 11 spot I'll just put a different system in its place. And then the other one I'll move to 12 or wherever I want to move it. So by having gaps in my numbering system, it lets me insert things easily into, that doesn't sound good at all. It lets me insert things into various parts of the setup. If I had one through 95 booked and I bought a new system that's old, I may not want to make it 96. I may want to insert it earlier uh, in the setup, but I don't want to have to bump all those out of the way, so that's why I have gaps. Hopefully that makes sense. So the, the numbering system I have is just a way of keeping everything organized. In the past, I experimented with uh, having some of them just be the console name on the Switch, but I just found it better for the numbering system, and numbers take up less space than system names. Troy's Movies also asked, what's the rarest game slash system you own? I don't pay too much attention to the rarity guides, and I don't know which ones are dependable. Judging by what I see, Clay Fighter's Sculptures Cut for the N64 is a pretty rare game, and I was able to get that at some point. I attempted to get a full set of N64 games, so I do have some of the more rare ones in my collection. But eventually I kind of gave up on it during the pandemic when the prices of all the N64 games went up. As far as systems are concerned, I have the Jaguar CD, which is probably pretty rare compared to the other ones here. I have the original Odyssey. Didn't really sell that much to begin with, and then a lot of them ended up breaking down over time or got thrown away or whatever, so I don't think there's that many of those in the world. But probably my rarest system is the Apple Pippin, because who do you know has a Pippin? Malsiti asks, do you have a holy grail? Meaning something really rare that you don't have but want more than anything. I would like to have Panzer Dragoon Saga. I once actually had it in this house and I was selling it on eBay on behalf of my friend Greg. At that point, I should have just paid for it myself and bought it off of him, but I just wanted to get the sale over with and I don't remember how much it sold for but it was quite a lot even back then. That's probably the only time I'm ever gonna get that game in front of me again uh, other than being on the other side of a display case. It's more than just I need it because it's rare, it's because I don't like the idea of having Panzer Dragoons 1 and 2 and then the one on the Xbox and not having that fourth one around to play. Yes, I know there was a Game Gear release as well, but main console wise, there was four games and I'm always gonna have that hole of the missing game. I actually triggered a memory just now. I actually rented that game in the 1990s. I remember not enjoying it that much, but I may have been missing the point of the game because it was different from the other ones. Anyway, uh, yeah, it'd be nice to have that game. Weed Ghost asks, do you have Alien Hominid GBA? It's one of the rarest games I've seen. That's actually a European only release and I don't go out and buy too many European games. I do have the Bubble Bobble game for the Master System, but the uh, Alien Homin Hominid, I don't have much interest in it. I've never played any of those games, I think, and I uh, probably will not be pursuing it. And judging by the way you've commented about it, it's unlikely I'm gonna come across it anyway. Sam V asks, what's the rarest NES game you own? It is probably Scat. He also asks, what's a rare NES game that you want to get? And I would say Gun Knack, because I like shooters no matter what system they're on. Even uh, Atari shooters, I love those. So that's the end of this QA session. I hopefully answered your questions in a good way.
And sorry about the echo you heard in that video. Next time, I'm gonna be more prepared for that. By the way, I recently did a video about the GameWave game console. If you haven't heard about it, you might wanna click that link. It's a pretty crazy story. May your games make you happy and smart, and may people respect you for playing them. So long, everybody.